Okay, so we probably can resume our tutorial. Uh, first thing I should claim is some, uh, some audience, some people actually ask me where, where to get this tutorial. The tutorial, all the slides are actually available on the web. If you go to KDD, I mean go to KDD conference, the website, then you go to the tutorial. Uh, in the tutorial, I think there are, there's a one link called slide. You just click the button, you actually will get, download the whole set of slides. You know, some, because of limited time, we do not cover in detail. So feel free, if you get any question uh, during the conference, maybe the best time we can chat. Okay. Um, after that, of course, you can send the emails. But you know, usually the email on the technical part of the reply is a little slow. Uh, the tutorial actually was worked out by quite a few of our PhD, you know, in my group. So likely, you know, if you get a particular one, you look at the paper, look at the reference. The first author is the best one instead of all four to me because I was swamped by too many emails. Okay. So let's uh, get into the part three. Part three is on pattern-based method for attribute discovery. Okay. See whether is this still working? Seems uh, I'm not sure whether seems it's not uh, not behaving well. Okay, so it, it run on a battery or something? I have. Oh, I see. Okay, it was turned off. So if you look at the whole module, we have uh, one, two covered. Now there's the third one, and we have the fourth one. Actually, the fourth one is a bundle of quite a bunch of things, so it's quite heavy. Uh, to that extent, I try to speed up. Not every slide I give a lot of time, so you probably uh, know why I have to skip, because we have limited time. Uh, the attribute discovery, this work actually was uh, mainly done by Dr. Meng Jiang. His, he, he, if you look at the, the tutorial, we get a four author. The third, third author, Meng Jiang, is a, a chief author. Okay. He uh, definitely would love to come to present his uh, stuff because that paper actually has been accepted by KDD 2017, right, this conference. Mm, just unfortunately, I really love this paper, but the paper was a poster, was not really presented in the conference. But it's a really nice work. Uh, we, my group does have uh, other papers in the presentation, but I like this one most, telling the truth, okay? And this one, Dr. Meng Jiang, I give a little introduction because I, I did not introduce him before. Uh, he uh, has been in my group for two years almost two years. Uh, he already joined uh, uh, as an assistant professor in University of Notre Dame. Okay. Uh, that actually was the reason he could not come, because he's in a visa transition from, from my postdoc position to faculty position. There's a visa transition. During the transition time, he, if he goes to Canada and go back to US, it cause some complication. So it, their lawyer in Notre Dame say you cannot go outside of US at this point. So unfortunately, he could not come. So I have to present for him. But he did it really well. He got uh, the year, I think two years ago, when I recruit him from Tsinghua University. He got uh, the computer science, Tsinghua University got the dissertation award. Okay. And also he works with uh, uh, Christos Falusos, uh, professor at CMU. He visited CMU for nine months during his PhD. Uh, Crystal said he, nine months generated more than 10 papers, okay? But anyway, you know, he's a very, very energetic uh, researcher. And this paper, I can give you this example, you probably see is very interesting. In the sense, we got a huge amount of text data. Uh, this one is just uh, something, for example, extracted from wiki or newspaper, okay? Uh, of course, human read it, you, you understand it. For example, the sentence like uh, President uh, Blaise Compare's garment of Burkina Faso was founded something. Okay. 
Actually, we, I do not know the country. There, was a con there is a country called Burkina Faso. Of course, if you really check it in Wiki, you actually can find this one in somewhere in the middle of uh, Central America. Okay. And it's a tiny country, and the president, nobody mentioned it, the Campari. Okay. I actually do not know him at all. Okay. So in that sense, how the machine can automatically extract this facts stayed in the newspaper. Okay. Then finally find all those countries, big or small, all those presents can get it correctly to generate a table or something. So that's the general philosophy. That means whether from here, from those sentences, you can generate the entity, which is a country, you can generate attribute name, which is a present, and you can generate attribute, attribute value, which is blast compare. And more, if you read a little more, you may even generate this uh, country's population, or this country, or this present's age. Okay. Those we call information extraction. Okay. The information extraction, that means you want to extract entity, attributes, and values all out of this. Then you can turn the unstructured text data into structured knowledge base. So it's very fascinating. But the problem is we do not really have enough training data, right? And everything we want to be automated. And also we want to be correct, to be sensitive, to extract a lot. That means the precision recall, all these will count. Can we do this automatically? Okay. And, but uh, Xiang just mentioned we have tools to generate types. That means if we can get a type, for example, we may have a type called country, it may have an attribute called president, or you may have a location, you may have an attribute called population, you have a person, you may have age as a person, as an attribute. Can we generate this by typing then we can go back to extract those facts from the text. So that's a major problem. Okay. That means if you think about this from the text, we may want to get a lots of different kinds of patterns. Okay. The pattern, of course, we everybody knows data mining actually work on the frequent patterns or sequential pattern, graph pattern, all these patterns. But actually, besides the data mining community, there are communities, for example, uh, in natural language processing, in document analysis. For example, the very famous one called Hearst Pattern, uh, done by a professor in UC Berkeley called Marty Hearst. And she actually got a, uh, the, the pattern extracted from the documents. So finally, people actually named the pattern by her name called Hearst Pattern. So we will see there are lots of such patterns. And, uh, Meng, actually in this KDD conference, he published another method called Metapad. So in this talk, I mainly will discuss Metapad. Of course, I'm going to discuss a lot of previous work as well. Okay. So the, the text mining, besides mine, like a clustering classification, a very interesting one is try to find patterns. Okay. Then we already discussed from from the large text, we can find phrases. That one, we use some kind of frequent pattern concordance, we can mine it. But now, there's one more thing. It's we get phrases, it's not enough. We want to get types. We want to extract the entities, structures out of text. So that's a major task. Actually, there are lots of uh, previous studies. One interesting study is in 1992, Marty Hurst uh, published a paper called The Lexicosyntactic Patterns. Okay. That one has been very popular, cited very interesting and useful. For example, uh, if you get a noun phrase, uh, like you can say countries, such as, say, United States, Canada, or Russia, or uh, you know, China, you may say this. This such as, if you say countries such as United States or China, actually, to a certain extent, 
you will think United States, Russia, China, Canada are just instances of country, right? So immediately, based on this, this linguistic signature features, you actually can get United States is a country, Russia is a country, Canada is a country. You can get all these. So this actor, this kind of thing, is Marty Hurst. Say, if you read the text, a human can do this. The machine can do this as well. So it is very precise. In many cases, it's correct. It's better if you get it many times. You definitely will say correct. But the problem is the recall is low. You think about this. If I say United, uh, you know, countries such as the United States or China or something, there are more than 200 countries. You, nobody will say countries like this list all the countries. So the big countries are there. The small countries are missing. Okay. The, the recall actually is low, especially unit 2080 or the long tail. The very long tail are all missing. You get a few major ones. So, so the recall is low. Can we actually go into the text? We can enhance the recall as well and get a highly precision one. There are some bootstrapping method. That means not only you have such as or something, you have many other things. You can boost it. Okay. But a very interesting boosting one actually was using you know, those strings. You get a, like a different other language features, like, for example, you, there's a headquarters based or something. You use all the different signatures. You try to boost it up. Okay. And people study this kind of things. You, you use those linguistic features. Uh, I probably will not get into many uh, details, but there are several major groups. One group uh, is in CMU called Never Ending Language Learner. You know, now, okay. That one, I think, is by Tom Mitchell's group. Uh, anybody in CMU or I mean, read in natural language, you must know that never end, end language learning is a very big project and has been going for many, many years. They extract those patterns and they turn them into logic rules and they can do inferences. There are lots of fancy things, very nice things can be done, okay. So, uh, actually, they build a called Open IE or Open Andy something. University of Washington has quite a lot of efforts on that, uh, especially I think uh, uh, Asioni, he was a professor in, in Washington, but now is more like uh, heading the, language, the AI square, Allen Institute of uh, AI. Okay. So that one, they do a lot of it information extraction as well. Okay, so you, you probably can read a lot of papers and they have a lot of online publications and media, news media, there are lots of things. Another very interesting project X was done in Google. Google actually has uh, Alon Halevi, uh, of course now he's not in Google, but he was in Google research leading a big team working on this project called Biperpedia project. Biperpedia project actually is trying to use, for example, Hearst pattern is one of the things they can use. Another very interesting thing is Google has a huge, huge web logs. Okay. People are actually sending queries and you answer something. There are lots of data. You, you can extract those things and you can extract patterns out of it. Okay. So, they did a lot of work on this. I will not get into very detail, but they did publish a few very impactful papers. People actually read it. I actually visited Google last uh, March, March last year. Okay, uh, actually Luna was there. We actually got the meeting, lunch, and all these. But Google actually very impressive. They told me they say, for example, like a country, country is an entity. How many attributes you can automatically Extract. Okay, they extract over 100,000 attributes. Uh, for example, pre uh, country may have present, may have population, may have this. How many of these distinct ones? They get over 100,000. Nobody can imagine you can extract that many. And the accuracy is over 90%. Okay, so that's very amazing. 
And uh, then you may say, the, war, the, the game is over. OK, actually, the game is just started. The reason is there are lots of things. You extract the values. You, uh, you extract the attributes. You also want to get the right values as well. Plus, not everybody has you know, like a so gigantic web logs, right? For example, if you work on medical science or you work on mechanical engineering, there is no such web logs. You actually can mine it, right? So can we do this just based on large corpus, OK? So uh, that's actually the Alon Halevi last year, Triple W, uh, 2016. They got a paper to show how they really dig in to get those 100,000 attributes out in high quality, which is a very, very impressive work. Uh, I actually took this work. I give it to Meng Jiang. I say, Google has web logs. We have nothing. We have no web logs at all. But there are lots of web logs can mine. Actually, it's inside the text. Can we dig this inside the text? Then we probably can build a very powerful engine. We can do information extraction. Okay, that's the one we started with. Okay, uh, this is uh, Renan. All of these are the Google's work. I should say we did reference this, but I will not spend too much time on this. But it's very interesting. Okay, sorry. I think, yeah. Another line's work. Okay, is uh, doing the pattern mining is from uh, Wycombe's group, Gerhard Wycombe in Germany. Okay. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, Max Planck Institute. Okay, that's a very famous one. Uh, what he did, uh, one famous work called PATI. PATI actually says some kind of pattern mining. Okay. What they do is they use a frequent pattern, go into this text, and finding those frequent patterns, those patterns actually later, for example, uh, if you look at a President Barack Obama's government of the United States reported something. Then you find many of such things. Then you get a President Barack Obama. Then you will find it. Actually, then later you'll find it that there's a United States there. You'll get a United States President Barack Obama or extracted. Okay. So they can extract this automatically. The, the recall is pretty high because you get so many patterns you can read. Good. But the precision is not that high, because you think about the natural language can say a lot of things. They may even say United States and, and some something. Okay, uh, Then you may have another, uh, say, present of some, somewhere else. So for example, they say the, uh, some something in the United States and uh, President Putin. But if you do not know, you will think, oh, the United States president become Putin. OK, but actually, this is definitely wrong, because that end actually separates the whole thing. Okay. So you probably can see there are lots of wrong things can also be digged out mistakenly. So you will get a pre low precision. Okay. So how can we solve those problems? How can we really mine this automatically from the very large corpus? That's a problem. The problem, of course, uh, Meng Jiang, this first paper, did not solve all these problems. Okay? Actually, he, he still, uh, last night, he just sent another paper out, you know, further refine the problem, okay? refine the solution. But the key is, if you look at this, you say there, you get a huge corpus. You want to mine things, there's room to, to get it. Okay? So what he got is, the first thing is you want to get uh, entity, attribute name, attribute value. You want to use frequent pattern, but you need to watch out if you can generalize them into types. Then these types and patterns somehow can mutually enhance each other. Okay. Then what uh, the general philosophy, if you look at this, this one actually is said is in KDD 2017. It's right in this conference. If you want to know more, there's a poster. Uh, actually, because Meng Jiang cannot come, I recommend that poster. You can actually go, go down to the poster session. If you want to know more, we can discuss more. Okay. But general philosophy is this. If you, got, if you get those texts, okay, 
you can actually extract something out of the text. Some actually you can, can be typed. If the type is, for example, the type is country, you, you, you can see there's a Burkina Faso you may not know. But you actually know United States President Barack Obama that appear in the, in the newspaper almost all the time that time, right? Then you actually get a United States as a country. You, instead of you say United States, you actually say now this one actually is a dollar sign, it's a type country. Then you get a United States President Barack Obama, you get a Russian President, say, Vladimir Putin, or you get a France President who and who. All these, once you get it into dollar country, they all collapse into the same thing. Right? You can think about this. If you get a, a dollar country, you can actually, any country will become a dollar country. Okay. Then the president is still there, then you get a name. If you can get this, this become a meta pattern. So called meta pattern is some is a meta symbol, like a dollar country can replace any country. And the dollar name can or dollar person can replace any person. Then this pattern becomes so popular. And immediately you can say this actually is a so frequent, so popular pattern, I can use this to match any other sentence like this book in a fossil. I do not know, but it's, it just matches this pattern. Likely this one is a country. Likely this one is the name of the president of this country. So you get it, right? You can see. You can use this pattern because it's so popular in the, in the corpus. Okay. So now we can see the game. Now I already show you what's a secret. The secret is you get a very large corpus. Okay. Of course, how large it is, you, just thinking about it, you get a year's newspaper, you suppose. You, you, you grab it. Then, of course, this one itself, like present blast comparison garment of Burkina Faso, that one itself, you only see it once or twice. It's not that frequent. Okay. But the present, you see a lot of times. Then that one's a name. You can actually uh, change, get this phrase, say this one's name. Then you get a present name. But the remaining one is still not as popular, but if you look at this, you, you change this one to Barack Obama, you will see that's popular. But you say that's not still popular enough. Then what about US President Bar Barack Obama? That one is very popular, right? So the key is they are very, very popular meta patterns. They are not so popular meta patterns, but the constant, the name, US, map this US government, okay? Then Barack Obama, uh, present, they all map each other. That means you will be able to find a synonymous patterns. Those are very, very popular ones, not those not so popular ones, but from the meta pattern wise, they are popular. This is number one popular. This actually is, so many things collide with this. They are synonymous patterns. If you find synonymous pattern, those rare things, you just fill in. Okay, that's exactly how human learn. Right. You get a new country, you never heard of it. You get a new name, you never heard of it. But why you read this newspaper, you can fully understand it. Because that's a pattern, right? You learn in exactly the same way. That's machine can do this, right? So the general philosophy is you get a meta pattern. The meta pattern, you get a synonymous pattern because they have so many things repeating, repeating. You say those meta patterns essentially the same. Ex express the same same meaning. So you can get this, then the, the game is over because you can extract a lot of things. Okay. So I probably be you, you can see the first advantage is you almost need no annotation. Nobody tries to learn it. You learn from the massive corpus. Okay. There's no domain knowledge required, no query log required. You just need a very large one, but you just find a pattern. Then you just replace them by the type symbol. Then you become so popular, you would say this must be a pattern. Then you collapse those, those synonymous patterns, then everything will be understandable. Okay. So you probably can see we did use a few things in our past study. One thing we use is phrase mining. 
you, you get a phrase like uh, Burkina Faso or United States of America. You get those pattern phrases. Then you recognize types. That's exactly Xiang just mentioned this. And you can do fine grain typing. That's what uh, he also mentioned this. So you get all these lines. You finally will be able to, to get those meta patterns. Okay. And once you get these meta patterns, you, how to get this meta pattern? Actually, this meta pattern, whether you need this off, or you need this in, or you need to chop it, or the end should not be there, actually all these you can justify automatically by the freeze mining for criteria. Remember, we said freeze mining, you want to find it you based on the frequent one, based on concordance, based on completeness, based on informativeness. Now we treat the meta symbol in exactly the same way as the other phrase. Then we actually find whether this one is valuable, whether this one is the right boundary, you actually can find it automatically. And once you do this, you actually can do the, okay, sorry. You can do synonymous pattern grouping. What is synonymous? Because they express the same meaning. But how do you know that? You came from Mars, how do you know it, it get the same meaning? Just because there are so many instances. You think about, it. Uh, say, US President Barack Obama, there are so many ways to say it. You can say, President Barack Obama of the United States of America. Or you can say, US President, you can say, uh, Ob Barack Obama, you get a comma, you say, US President, uh, President of US, or something. Or you can say it so many different ways. But since you repeat so many times, you know they are the same, okay? So finally, you will get, you will get those patterns all getting together, okay? Uh, just uh, for example, just thinking about the uh, H, okay? Actually, uh, you, uh, I'm, I was working on, I've been working on the NIH, some projects. There's one professor uh, in Stanford University. What he was doing is, he says, People fill up the form on their age. The patients fill up their age. There are about 100 different ways to say the age. We know it. The people can write it in any different way, say, that's my age. Okay? But how the machine can correctly recognize everything? Okay? Then even you get a patient age, you need some robots. But the current robots just cannot figure out because there are so many ways. What he finally found the way is you get a nice interface and people easily fill up this. You get two or three interfaces, they all means this, the people just fill up, you are done. But you require people to fill up the form. But remember, when you say it, how many people say, I have a template to fill up the form? Okay, you say it freely. Okay. Once you say it freely, it's our way to use all these kind of patterns to get all these. Right? So you still give people full freedom. People, natural language, people want to say it naturally, rather than you fill up the forms, right? So the form is a way for somebody, but it's not a way for, for natural people, right? So you, you, you want to say a different way, okay? Then another interesting thing is, we said the meta pattern. The meta pattern, the meta symbol, can be high, can be low, okay? For example, you have a Barack Obama's H. Okay, or Trump's age. But not all the age represent the present, right? If you generalize, say, presidents say age in this way, the doctors say age in this way, then the kids say age in this way. Actually, they say the same way, okay? So that means for the age, you need to generalize to person, okay? You should go very, very high to go to the person instead of say, this is the president, this is the prime minister, you know, you, you actually go all the way. Even this one is a present, right? But some other thing you probably see, for example, if you want to see the country's present, you cannot say location present. You generalize to anything's present. But because this is a country, or this is a governor, is a state, right? So you want to get the right one. So how to get the right one? Actually, in the paper, he also mentioned to get the right one, you need actually to see the, the distribution. I mean, you look at all the distributions, and you find the distribution, the person, and you look at the artists, the athletes, or tackers, or presidents. 
you actually find they take a small portion, the, the actually things can be naturally merged. They just merge them into person. The other one you can see they have a good partition. Okay, once you see this partition, you retain in the lower level. Okay, so that, that, that's a one. And you, he just show a lot of experiments, but I can just show you. In, in the newspaper, he used his method. He actually find every, but every country is present, including this Burkina Faso. And almost every country, every company, big or small CEO, because they are in the newspaper. You actually can dig them out. And uh, more interestingly, he went to the biomedical literature. Okay. He actually can find those patterns, group them together automatically. Nobody trained it. You can see what it get is treatment was used to treat certain disease. Then treatment and disease has a lot of different patterns, but you can extract it in the biomedical literature. You can find a disease and their treatment automatically. You can extract them. Okay. And this one actually said the bacteria was resistant to antibiotics. Then you actually can find which bacteria resistant which, uh, you know, which uh, antibiotics. From the PubMed, you can extract a huge table, can contain all these. And uh, he verified that the majority are correct. Okay. So that's the one. Uh, of course, you, uh, whether they're still, you can generate mistakes. Okay. You can. The, the recall is pretty high, but not as high as PADI, because the PADI can almost generate anything, including some garbages. But the, the precision is not, it's pretty high, but not as high as we like. So he actually just submitted a paper this morning, actually, to Wisdom. Uh, it's the double blind review. I cannot say all the authors, but I can, what I can say is he is doing the truth finding, the correct any wrong patterns he can generate. It. Okay, so they still need some some choose finding. I think Luna actually is a, is an expert on this. He actually is using the previous choose finding algorithm and put into this and develop it a method. Try to judge which one is wrong, which one is right. What is negative pattern? What is positive one? And then you can guard against this. You can generate the right one. Okay, so this is very interesting, but uh, it's ongoing work. Okay, so. Uh, I think I can probably should go over this one quickly. There are lots of papers he mentioned, but since we have limited time, I will move on to the applications. Okay. Application means you, you can do all these, play all these tricks, but how do you apply to the real world? There are lots of studies, and we did some study on this. I will show you the last module applications. Because of limited time, I probably will show you only three major applications. We do have more, but uh, you know, we have limited time. I just uh, pick up something. One thing is we call multidimensional exploration of text corpora. What is multidimensional exploration? I mean, you get a huge corpus, right? But the corpus, you can extract some dimensions. You think about the dimension could be like, suppose you have lots of company reports. You can ex extract something is about the company name. It's one dimension, like, you know, like Apple, uh, Samsung, and all, you know, all these, Amazon, all these things. And you can extract the time, or you can extract location. You can also extract the products, right? And once you can extract this, you assume actually the documents for example, if this document is about Apple, suppose MacBook uh, 2017, it's, it will be in the corresponding cell. Okay? Because one is a company, this Apple. One is a product, it's MacBook. Okay? And one is a time, right? You can get this. You may get lots of documents inside. Okay? So this whole structure we call tech, text cube. Because the whole you know, corpus of text, you design a multi-dimensional view, you put the text inside, you generate a gigantic text cube. Okay, this is like a data cube, but it's text cube, okay. And for this text cube, how can we do analysis in this text cube, okay? 
What kind of analysis? The analysis can be many. For example, you may want to summarize. You, you can say, oh, you said it's Apple, you know, MacBook 2017. I want you to summarize this one to give me, there are, say, 300 documents. I don't want to read 300 documents. Give me the major things, major keywords or major sentences or major, major important things. Say it in a summarized way. Can you do it? Okay. Another one is comparison. Comparison means you say 2017 versus 2016. Can you give me the comparison? You get a documents 2017, you get 300 documents, 400 documents 2016, compare them. Okay. Of course, people don't want to read these 100 documents. They want a machine to compare them. Can we do it? Right. So there are lots of lots of things we can do with play with this multi-dimensional data cube. Right. So this multi-dimensional text cube, to some extent, is more, you know, attractive than the typical data cube. The typical data cube is like a Walmart. You just get a summarize and compare the different dollars. Those are all numerical data. Now we all get text data, but we want to do the similar thing, a more powerful thing. Okay. So that means you actually can think about you really structure your text documents in the multi-dimensional space, and you can slice and dice, you can do summary, you can do comparison. That's what we want, okay. Actually, a few years ago, I got a student called Fang Bo Tao. He, he is going to defend his thesis actually this, this month in August, okay. But what he did is he implemented one using some kind of human curation, which we collaborate with NLP people. He put in the data cube, and he can do a lot of very fancy things. For example, just give you an example. And he wants to see, uh, he used 2013 uh, New York Times, or so AP, uh, Associated Press, all these news, put in the, this text cube. And 2013, they have like an earthquake. There's a Haiti earthquake. Okay. Haiti earthquake has lots of donation or something, those uh, efforts. He actually was uh, trying to play, say, he wants to see who donated to Haiti earthquake. Okay. So he just uh, uh, look at this, he said, earthquake donation, and he put it as a keyword down there in 2017. And then actually this cube really shows, okay, because you can summarize the person or organization, summarize it, and there's a, like a red cross or some kind of singers. Uh, one thing he can recognize is Hillary Clinton actually made a donation. It's also quite public. So it make uh, all these donation. He actually shows the people the Haiti earthquake donation, you know, in different amounts or different mentioning and in the curve. So it's uh, very nice. It's automatic because nobody, he just extracted from the text uh, all these names and person mention how many times. That's it. So that's actually, the, that's a one. It's pretty useful. And uh, I perkin, this is just to show you the interface and what things you can do. Uh, this is pretty useful because you, they have the link, link to the original documents. You can click those documents, you can read it, okay. Uh, those are the keyword the frequency distribution and you can show the, 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 I should say, this is more like a topic model. You show the different uh, keywords and dis different uh, probability distribution. You get a word cloud. You can do a lot of things. Okay. Now, he later worked on the comparative analysis part. Because uh, you show the summary, people say, that's fine. I can, based on the frequency of the keywords or phrases, I can show the summary. But how I can do the sensitive comparison? Okay. He actually took like a China economy uh, 2016 as an example. He actually originally tried it just using, for example, summarize the China economy. And he found there are lots of things unexpected there. Okay. The interesting thing is in the China economy, their Japanese currency, USA, all these things are there. The reason why, 
because probably China doing trading use a lot of Japanese yen, so they have the Japanese currency there. They probably do a lot of trading with USA, the USA there. But that's not really China economy. The Japanese yen, somehow it should be Japan economy, right? So he said that this summary, even just based on frequency to do summary, is very confusing, okay? So how we can automatically, if I summarize China economy, I really get the keywords, just China economy, nothing else, okay? It's really not USA, not Japan, okay? And then he found, actually, if we organize things in the data cube, we do have a lot of advantage to do the sensible summary. How, what's the advantage to do sen sensible summary? You think about it, you take the China economy, you have several dimensions as a comparative dimension in the data cube. Here is China, and here is US, here is Russia, here is, uh, here is uh, France, or here is Japan, okay? That means if I put these key phrases into China economy, the first thing I have to guard is this one should not belong to Japan, should not belong to US, okay? And another thing is, another dimension is economy. Economy, there is a politics or history or education or entertainment, there are lots of things, okay? That means if I got China economy, it's not China politics, it's not China education or sports. So then he said the natural summarization in the text cube should guard against both sides. That means every dimension, their sibling, will try to rob your phrase. And you finally confirm, this is mine, not my siblings, then I'll give it to you. Then the final summary will become very sensible. Okay. So that's his philosophy. And with this philosophy, he basically say, in the data cube, okay, everybody is not independent because you know your siblings in multi-dimensional way. You know your parents, you know your children. Okay, then you have the guard, it's yours, it's not your children's, not your siblings, okay. So what he did is he looked at the cell, he basically got three standards to put this phrase into this cell. One is called integrity, that means it must be a good phrase, actually the phrase mining will give you reasonably good integrity. Another one is popularity, they mentioned this phrase, uh, very popular in the cell, the third one is distinctiveness. That means I guard, it's not my parents, not my children, not my sibling in any dimension. Actually, how to guard this? He invented one called inverse classification. What is inverse classification? That means I first use this tool. I found a phrase, say this phrase is mine. Okay. But uh, you have to do auction. What you do auction is you throw it, throw it. You throw this phrase up. Say, my sibling, my parents, or children compete. Can you compete with me? If you compete with me, like a Japanese currency, it belongs to Japan, Japan will grab it. It's not yours, then you lose this Japanese currency, okay? So, finally it worked out well. It's really yours, even you throw it out, and nobody there to rob it, then that's yours, okay? So, he used this idea he actually work out how to evaluate the distinct cells, use inverse classification, the detailed formula, and of course he used those uh, IR methods, BM25, or you know, TFIDF, those things, okay. But uh, he compare with many, many methods. Uh, the comparison, of course, shows good, but I probably show you the real test, you will be convinced, okay. One test is he took 2016 news data, this US news, and he partitioned them into different cells. Then you look at this. For example, the first one said US gun control, about US news about gun control. Then you look at the, the phrase he finally grabbed is the gun law, National Rifle Association, gun rights, background checking, gun owners, assault weapon ban, mass shooting, high capacity magazines, Gun legislation, gun control advocates. You look at every sentence, it's almost like a human did it, right? So, and you look at others, like immigration, all these things. It's really 2000 news, 2016 news. He summarized, he grabbed those things. It's almost like a human did it, okay? It's a phrase, a very sensible phrase, he grabbed it, okay? And then we show this because I, I'm working on the NIH project, 
I show this to UCLA medical school. I think, I told them it's boring because it's computer science stuff. They got very excited. They say, I'll give you the task. Okay. What task they give us, actually it's very interesting is this. What they give us is this, this is uh, showing this. They are, they are working on cardiology. Their medical school is very famous on cardiology. And their cardiology researcher told us, cardiology is not one disease. There are six major categories, like a vessel problem, muscle problem, uh, or you know, like a heart uh, arrest or AFib. There are many, many different things, okay? They say for these six categories, we want to find a proteins which actually dedicate to this category but not to the other categories, okay? Because they can find a lot of common proteins is dedicated to many of these categories. But those categories, they say, it's not a, you get AFib or you get a muscle or viral problem. I treat you a muscle viral problem, I treat you this protein, okay? But if this protein shows up in all kinds of heart disease or even shows in cancer, Actually, it's not a real one I want to, choose, to treat because that's unlikely is the cause of this disease. Even I do not know the cause, effect. Okay. But those signals was buried by many. Okay. We say we are not medical science. We actually do not know which protein. They say, don't worry. We give you 250 proteins. We know these must be important proteins. And what do you do? Is you go to PubMed. I do not require you to extract the whole article, just extract abstracts on cardiovascular disease. We did it, we get over half, half a million articles. They say that's good enough. Half a million abstracts, find those distinct molecules dedicated to this, this, this heart problem, not the others. And we did it. They say, how long you run it? We say uh, quite a few hours. Okay, because it's a, so many, it's a half a million abstracts. Then they look at it, they say, wow, this is really great. They say, there's a one disease, everybody knows top one protein, they treat that one. But there's a substantial group of people, they have no response with, no response with this treatment. Okay. Especially children, likely their mechanism of the heart problem is different from adults. Okay. But we do not know which protein actually caused this problem, but not cause the others, okay? Now you give us number two, number three choices. We actually originally thought this may be, but we, we're not sure. Now you give us this. I said, those are the published articles. Why you do not know it? He says, you know, many of these articles were working on mice or some other animals, or some other, you know, different disciplines. And PubMed, every year, the incremental, incremental number of articles put into PubMed is over one million. Then you probably say, they, they say, who dare to read one million papers a year to extract this? And if you ask to read those, uh, those uh, uh, abstracts to extract it, they calculate, they say it will take us 20 years of reading. But you did it a few hours? Okay, that's great. Right? So they saved our life. So they actually told us they are going to try it, try these number two, number three proteins on some of these patients and see whether they respond. Okay, so they say you may even save lives. Okay, so that, that's very interesting. You can see the, 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 the text mining could be useful. And that's why they got a heat map uh, from this. Another interesting thing is we work with natural language one. The natural language one, they say, you know, human, for any, for example, there are lots of demonstrations, like a Baltimore demonstration, okay? And they do have, some they have captions, some they have no captions. But the problem is, even they have captions, you read it, unless you really inside this, otherwise it doesn't make, make sense. For example, one caption may say, the woman's shouting around the crowd or something. So you actually do not even know what's happening, the woman is shouting, unless you really know what's the context. But remember, all of these accompany with articles, okay? So you get a bunch of articles on 
Baltimore demo, demonstration on this one, suppose you have 20 articles. You have other demonstrations. You actually can compare them. You can automatically summarize the keywords. Then you use those keywords to find which sentence or which sentences cover most of these keywords. You grab those sentences out. Okay. So that sentence form the caption is very, very meaningful because it's almost like you grab the most distinctive things compared to other demonstrations or other Baltimore things. Okay. You actually give them a, a caption encapsulate a sentence. That sentence was done by human, but actually it's automatically extracted by us. So they, they found it's far better than the original caption. Okay. So you probably can see it's pretty useful. That's a multi-dimensional one. But the multi-dimensional one, we, we're still working on it because one interesting thing, we actually just submitted a paper, is how to automatically populate this space, this multi-dimensional space. You think about it, you can easily con construct a multi-dimensional structure. For example, you construct a structure, this is a company name, this is a product, this is some, something, or complaints or something. But how do you put the right document into the right slot itself is a problem. Okay. So actually our new work is on how to correctly put in the slot because some you should put a little lower cell, some put a little higher dimension. There are lots of issues you have to solve. Okay. So, but uh, I will not get, give the detail. Another one I probably want to mention is latent key phrase inference. A latent key phrase inference general philosophy is this. Okay. You get a lot of documents, okay. but uh, you give me a document, you don't want to read the document if it's long, but you want to automatically say what the document is about. Okay. You, you don't want to read it, but you want to understand it. But how could you do this? Okay. The interesting thing is any document Originally, there are lots of things. You, for example, the easiest one is a bag of words. Okay, you probably know bag of words is, you don't read the documents, they, they grab you the bag of words and based on the frequency or something, they can sort those things and finally show the bag of words. Okay. But the, you, you can even do bag of phrases. But those are not a very good summary. Okay. It's good for some indexing. Okay. So, and people actually did a lot of, for example, concept-based model, and there are some, like a word to back recently doing this and try to get a, you know, some kind of summary. And so Jia Lu, he now joined Google Research. He actually did his last piece of work in his PhD is using the phrase, using the whole thing, but not using the word to back, but using a little like a latent key phrase inference model. It's more like a Bayesian model and try to work out to automatically get the, 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 the cloud. Then you give me a phrase or give me a document, I can automatically generate all the surrounding representative phrases. Okay. So <clears throat> you, you can think about this is, suppose you get lots of, lots of uh, originally, you get lots of different uh, keywords or different uh, documents, you can use bag of phrases, you can generate something at the very, very beginning distribution. But this distribution is just the initial one. Okay. With this distribution, you can, based on their occurrence of frequency, which one is more frequent than the others, you start building up a little like a hierarchy, this kind of model. Okay. You can, based on the Bayesian inference, you can build this model. And with this, <clears throat> you actually can do a lot of uh, statistical analysis, uh, which I probably will not have time to get into detail. But for example, it, the, suppose the offline you get a phrase mining. Okay, then you have lots of do documents. You do this kind of mining, you can construct this this model. Okay, then online, you can give me one phrase, you can give me one sentence, you can give me one or a few documents as a query. So I don't want to read it, you summarize it, summarize surrounding things. Then actually this, this structure, you can think is an is a inference tree or something. Actually, it's not exactly a tree, but it's, it's kind of a, we call quality-free silhouette. 
essentially you you based on this you uh, the detail I don't really have time I probably will not get into very detail but I probably show you the results okay the, the, the first thing is he constructed this structure he actually used this structure to do document classification okay the document classification means you give me documents whether I can put in the right class and he used a lot of comparative methods you probably see there's something like a RSA, RDA, world to vac and all these are very popularly used. And he actually shows for, for example, for document classification. Uh, and, and another is phrase-related correlation analysis. He actually shows, for example, if you look at document classification, uh, there's RDA, there's a world to vac which is very popular used, and his classification accuracy is higher, both on the academic data and the Yelp data, okay? And, uh, but if you look at the real, uh, real example, you probably get convinced. The real example, for example, just look at the academic data. If you type RDA, okay, uh, everybody knows RDA actually is a little ambiguous because even in computer science, there are two very popular RDA. One is latent initial allocation if you work on topic model, but if you work on you know, some statistical way, that's a, that's a, there's a linear discriminant analysis, also called RDA. Okay. So if you type RDA in computer science literature, what do you get? You actually get a, the, the, the silhouette, that means related phrases. You will get latent linear discriminant analysis, latent initial allocation, topic models, and, uh, and they are also like a, like a generative model or topic, but they also have some face recognition things inside. So it's because it's both fields are mixed, the popular ones. But if you type RDA, then you type topic, that means you really want the RDA topic things show up. Then the linear discriminant analysis is all gone. And you, what you see is a latent initial allocation, topic, topic models, topic modeling, all these surrounding it, okay? And if you uh, give me, for example, even you give me a sentence or give me a, a text, then you don't have to read the text, it will show a bunch of most relevant phrases surrounding this text, okay? So this is a latent initial allocation. You use phrase mining, you use all these things, you can, it can help. Then the last one, actually it's not really the last one because there's another one, other applications. What I want to show you is if you really want to conquer the text, another very important thing is you want to find the, the different text, their structures. Okay. One structure called a set expansion. That means you give me a few seats. For example, you say Illinois, Maryland. You want to say within the text you want to find all the US states. Okay. Can we do that? Okay. Actually, there's one study by University of uh, uh, Michigan, it's Charles Mays group. What they did is called ego set. That means they, based on surrounding skip grams, okay, they try to say, for example, you, if you give me, say, red, blue, green, okay, uh, you probably want to say all the colors, but if you give me orange, it could be colors or it could be fruits, right? It's more like this. So there's ambiguity built inside. What they do is they try to, for each facet, they may generate something. So the, for, for example, you give me orange, I can give you a bunch of fruits or I can give you a bunch of colors, all from the text. Okay, but how do you do that? Essentially, it's try to uh, generate the skip gram. Okay? So he actually shows something pretty interesting. But uh, one interesting thing is we want to get a better quality of this uh, by people giving you from a large corpus, okay? Like you give me newspaper, okay? Then I only give you Illinois and Maryland. I want to get all the US states but not Canadian provinces, like uh, Nova Scotia will not be there, okay? Can we do that automatically without any human? without any other knowledge base, okay? So the, the interesting thing is there are two major thrusts to make it really 
working high quality. One threat is called context feature selection. That means you want to find the good features. The second one is called ranking-based unsupervised ensemble. That means you probably know ensemble. Ensemble is supervised. That means you get a multiple one, you finally vote. What about we do not have anybody supervised? We still get a multiple one. We rank them. We, we also voted by ranking them high consistently. Okay. So now I'm going to show you how this one may work even in the real life. Actually, this one was just accepted by ECMR PKDD. Uh, actually, just uh, last month got accepted. But I think it's pretty interesting. I want to introduce it. Let's uh, forget this related work. I mainly show you this picture. You probably get it. You see it's quite interesting. The first thing is you give me a bunch of seats, okay, like this. You say, Illinois, Virginia, Georgia, like this. You put it down there. A small number of seats, okay. Then you go to the text. You want to extract all the signals. The signal essentially is kind of pattern, if you think about pattern. We call it skip grams. You can extract those skip grams. Some you can use typing. Of course, we use phrase mining also. We can extract those skip grams. But those skip grams, some may give you the right one, some may give you the wrong one. Okay. So we are not quite sure all those features will be the high quality features because you grab it from the text. The text can say anything. Okay. What we do is we take those features, we partition them into multiple groups. Okay. Then we take these groups, we go into the text, we try to get the candidates out. Once we get, of course, based on the feature, you can rank those candidates, which one is very highly ranked, which one is not so highly ranked. You get a multiple, guy, multiple groups ranking feature in different ways. Okay. Suppose you, you, you can see here, you may get wines of California, you get Arizona, but you get a Quebec. Okay. You probably can see Quebec was there. And here, the second one you get, you may get to say, uh, uh, Florida, and then you get a Baya, California, then you get some, something, Arizona or something. You probably can see, sometimes you may mistakenly grab something like from Canada, or grab something from Mexico, or grab something from somewhere. Okay. But the interesting thing is, if you rank them, it's almost ask all these to vote. The the, like a Quebec or Nova Scotia, may not be consistently rank high. Because you think about it, you give me Georgia, you give me Illinois or something. You may get a Texas, you may get a California. But you think of Quebec, there are many, many signals. It's different from California or Georgia. So unlikely they will be consistent rank high. So in that sense, when you rank them, only the consistent rank high, you think they are really good. Then what do you do? You take this, you feed them back to the seeds. Originally, there's only, only two seeds, or one seed, or three seeds. You use subsets of features, you ensemble, you, you vote. You constantly vote high, you say, this is a good one. You put it back, then you redo the whole thing. Okay. Then you, they, they, you get more supports. Remember, any rounds, you make sure they are really rank high consistent. You grab those things in. Then you do this. And finally, you will get a very high quality results. Okay? So you will not get those Baya, California, or Quebec in. Okay? Because once you get Quebec in, they will get Ontario, they will get British Columbia, Nova Scotia in. Then it's a disaster. You know, US and Canada will be merged. Right? So that's not the case. So that's the reason you probably can see you will get a, a quality one. And using this, uh, he actually shows his method is substantially better than many other methods, including those embedding methods, ego sets. And he shows some real results. For example, one result is he took uh, Obamacare as a law. Okay. There's a patriotic act, Obamacare, clergy act, he put a two or three seats down there. He wants to find all the US laws. Okay. Then it's interesting, see, every iteration, he actually showed the pattern, showed the results. Every iteration, he grabbed 
really very, for example, this, they have a U.S. Patriotic Acts, U.S. Freedom Acts, Voting Right Acts, uh, Stock Acts, Religion Freedom Acts. He grabbed many, many U.S. laws, but not the others, into the set. And get a U.S. law actually from the newspaper cover. Okay, so it's a pretty interesting. And he took uh, like those uh, new uh, TV channels and grab all the other TV channels. He grabbed like uh, even medical ones. He grabbed a few medical ones and grabbed similar medical ones. That's a set expansion. He can get it in a in a very high quality. Uh, so that paper actually uh, will be published in the ECMR PKDD. Essentially, you do use uh, set uh, phrase mining all these, but you think you need to get sets, you can construct hierarchies, okay? Then another interesting one I want to show you is that one is good for, for the concrete, uh, uh, like uh, Illinois concrete entities. What about very abstract uh, things? For example, you have a machine learning graphic model and all these very, 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 abstract uh, technical terms. They don't have the signals. For example, Illinois, you can either say Illinois has a capital, has a population, has a governor, has you know, tax, all of these things clear. But uh, machine learning has no tax, no, no governor, no something common with graphic model. So there's no way you can just use the surrounding thing, uh, language features, the uh, signals, you can do it. But how can we do this? Okay. This one actually is a, is a new paper, it just a summit for, to review. Uh, it just summit this morning, I just say. And, but it's a very interesting. I want to just uh, grab, uh, just show you. It's that one, the algorithm name called taxogen, this taxonomy generation. You want to generate taxonomy. And a taxonomy generation, you probably can see, comparing to many others, the, the last three are all taxonomy generation. But one actually knock down one method, knock down the other methods generated is far higher than all the other methods. Okay. So how this one was done. Okay. I probably can show you this. The taxonomy generation, the first important thing is doing clustering, conceptual clustering. How do you do conceptual clustering? The very beginning, what you can do is you can do embedding. You probably think those uh, you know, word to back or phrase to back, this kind of tricks. You do embedding, of course, of course there are detailed embeddings I will not show you. But the embedding means you take those, those phrases, those machine learning or, you know, like a deep learning neural networks, all these things. You do embedding, the similar things were embedding in the similar space, right? So you, based on this embedding, embedded space, you can do clustering. You can do k-means, you can do those kind of clustering. But a very important thing is you do this clustering in the meantime, you want to say this siblings, you want to do the, the, the we call it distinctive analysis. Distinctive analysis, you grab this uh, terms, say probably a graphic model. You say belong to this one, but not belong to the other one, you actually will toss it up, say anyone wants it. Okay. If you don't want this, it's me. It's originally, I think it's mine. But if you want to grab it, you have give me good reason you can grab it. So you do this one. Okay, the interesting thing is, including the parents, they will be allowed to grab it. For example, if you say computer science, then you give me like an algorithm or computational approach, computation time, all these things. Actually, will not belong to machine learning programming language or a database, data mining. They will be pushed up to, much, to, to, to general computer science, okay? Those things really belong to information retrieval or database or machine learning will go down to their place. Okay. So that's the first, first trick. Okay. The second trick actually called local, locally confined, or we call local embedding. What is local embedding? Okay. The local embedding actually is a very tricky but a very useful. Okay. I, I probably give you a little hand waving on this local embedding. The high level, at very high level, you do embedding, you can distinguish, say, five or 10 different categories, no problem, okay? But once you get into machine learning, okay, you want to further divide it. Actually, there are lots of terms 
you, you, it's, they are so entangled, it's very hard to divide them. Because they definitely, if you put them in the whole space, they sort of like, they are all too similar. Okay. What we do is, now if you are dealing with machine learning or you are dealing with information retrieval, fine, we have to partition our original space into, into you know, confined partition space. That means you want to study further on machine learning, fine. Now I forget hardware, I forget algorithm, I forget all the other things. I only take those machine learning corpus there. Then I will work on this part to do embedding. Why? The reason is you get a machine learning. There are some machine learning algorithms or something, very popular terms. They will appear too often. It's almost like stock words. They will push it up. Because the local, locally embedding, it will further partition the lower one into different subsets. So that will make it very sensitive. You will do a very good job to get a lower level hierarchy constructed. Okay, I will show you the results you can see. This is all automatically generated. I think this is a case study on DBRP. You can see, uh, of course, we are not taking the whole DBRP. We take more like data science part or something. You probably can see you have intelligent agents, object recognition, learning algorithms, uh, cyber uh, cryptopic, and information retrieval. Okay, you, you can see it's a party into this. Of course, there are more categories, this one. Then you look at it, you go down to information retrieval, they immediately get into like a retrieval effectiveness, or uh, in, uh, interlingual, or web search, or you know something. They make it to, and then you look at the even web search, you go down into link structure, social tagging, uh, user interaction, or something. You actually can see, you go layer by layer, the, they really, really grab those very similar terms together. And the common term among all these will be pushed up. So actually, it become very sensitive, very sensible. You generate very high quality uh, ones. Uh, there are lots of results in the paper, but uh, the paper hasn't just uh, submitted, just been submitted. I will not get into very detail, but it's very elegant in the sense you really generate the concept of hierarchy in a very, very nice way, okay? So there are other things, but I don't think we should go over all the other things. There are several other things I've already just mentioned. One is a synonymous discovery. That means you want to automatically describe the synonyms. Okay. Uh, that one actually is accepted by this conference, KDD. If you like, you can go down. I think uh, Meng Chi, the first author, is there. You can go down there to, to discuss with him on this. Okay. This one, uh, I probably will not go. We don't really want to spend that much time. Another interesting one is expert funding in the bibliographic networks. X finding means you really want to find some good authors who are leading on certain research topics, okay? Uh, of course, it, it's useful in industry as well, okay? That one actually is the first one invent this local embedding, okay? Because the interesting thing was this. Originally, we, I give uh, students say you can do some projects as, a, as your research. One student said, I want to find an expert. I said, that's definitely a very good topic. I gave uh, him some, some work. Then the interesting thing is this. He says, he found a very strange behavior. High level, say machine learning, data mining, or database or something. You use embedding, you find a real good expert. The reason is, Nobody in the title, if you do machine learning, nobody in every title say machine learning. Okay, they say something much more concrete. So you don't use a concrete one, you won't find him. Okay? You won't find those experts. But a low level one, okay, if you use embedding, it's a big disaster. Okay, just think about this. He actually shows me a very interesting result. He said, everybody in my group knows uh, heterogeneous information network, it's Yi Zhou San. She's, uh, she, got a, she now is a professor in the UCRA. When she was doing PhD, she got a dissertation award on heterogeneous information network, got lots of papers. 
The key is you get heterogeneous information network. Once you do embedding, they actually embed any kind of communication networks or some computer networks inside or heterogeneous information systems or something inside. Once you do embedding, you get so many different terms inside. Those people are much senior than Yi Zhou San because she's a system professor. They basically swamp her. You'll never be able to find her even if you look at a long list. They found a lot of people working on computer networks or something, communications. There's nothing to do with it. Okay. The embedding is really bad. So then he actually come back to me and said, I love embedding, I hate embedding. Because the high level embedding is really good, the low level embedding really destroyed my purpose. Then I discussed with my PhD student, uh, Huang Gui. We discussed this. We found embedding is good, only you do it right. Okay. Actually, in the low level, you have to do the locally confined, constrained embedding. Then you really get it. So he actually, she worked on this. And finally found that you really, no matter you give me high and low, I actually automatically choose how to do embedding. I will always do it right. Actually, what he, she did is she actually showed quite a bunch of uh, her master comparing with others. And also some very uh, specific term, like a boosting or some general term. You know, then you find experts actually is, uh, Compared to the others, the experts found is really good. Okay, uh, of course, some reviewers still say boosting. You find uh, Shapiro, you find uh, Freud, but uh, uh, you actually find Leo Brayman. Uh, one reviewer actually said Leo Brayman actually is uh, working on bagging, is not on boosting. So you actually found the wrong one. But uh, of course, if you do locally confined embedding, boosting and bagging is so close. So you'll find a bagging expert as well. you find a Leo Bre Breiman. Actually, it's not bad. You think about it, they are all ensemble approaches, so close. But, but it's much better than other masters. They found some general machine learning guys, right? So uh, this is pretty interesting. I think I probably will not get into more details. We should go down to, uh, to summarize. OK, thank you. Yeah, so I will be um, just quickly go through our summary and um, briefly talk about um, some interesting or exciting future directions that we're thinking about. Um, so the core idea of what we talk about in this entire tutorial is, I think, um, two things. One is we try to um, get rid of the human efforts on um, annotating the sort of the training data for all kinds of tasks we are discussing here, including phrase mining, NED detections, NED typing, NED relation extraction, and many more other things. And then the principle that we get rid of this is we leveraging what people already put into those external knowledge bases, and we grab those facts out of the knowledge bases, map them automatically into the corpus that we are building at hand, and we are aware of there will be sort of a noise that um, co-produced by this very heuristic process, but we designed a model that are sort of robust to this noise. That's the first thing. And what made these models to be successful, um, to be chanted, is the massive amount of data that we are leveraging. And because there's a massive amount of data, we are assuming there's lots of data redundancy in terms of one entity names will appear hundreds or thousands of times in the different sentences where in those sentences you will also see surrounding words, let it be the words or phrases that are also co-occurring with other entities thousands or hundreds of times so that you can trend them all together and use these sort of co-occurrence as the opportunities for training better models. And with this in mind, we started lots of different problems in terms of mining structures from text, like phrase, entity types, attributes, relationships. And finally, we bring all this together. We try to build up a network just right from a raw text corpus using some reference knowledge bases. That's our Life Lab project that <coughs> focuses on life science domain. So with all this thing, we showed, it, showed you the big picture in making sense of massive corpora, which is taking the text we want to first transform the text into sort of a network structure. For example, a knowledge graph could be one way to represent the, the knowledge in the text, but there will be other ways we can, we can be exploring. 
And then we can try to apply the methods that works pretty well on this, net, like this graph or network structure. Many, many come from um, graph mining, network science, information network analysis, um, these, these different communities. And we can apply them back to analyze this network so that to understand what is happening in the tax corpus. So compared to um, what you may use to see which directly go from tax to knowledge using either sequence to sequence model or very sophisticated deep neural networks. The benefits of such a, uh, like a, like a framework is to make the process more transparent and uh, it's more interpretable. So you know what are the structured knowledge behind the tax and you know what your model is doing on those knowledge. So there's a couple of things we want to talk about by extending our works. Along the line of phrase mining, we know that there's many high resource language or popular language like English or Spanish, but there's also many more other low resource language or even languages with zero resource. Um, and how do you trade off between these two? We should take different strategies. So for those popular languages, you already have so many public data sets on um, part of speech tag on their parsing results that annotated by many human experts. So they are just off the shelf. You can take them to train whatever model you are uh, preferring. So we try to leverage those resources for popular languages. But once we switch to the low resource domains, we should take advantage of the massive tax corpus, those data redundant things. So this provides us the opportunity to whether we can do um, domain adaptation that we learn some use, though, some common knowledge uh, between different languages and borrow them from the popular ones to the low resource one. That's the one thing. Second, for the meta pattern discovery, we know that we only need human to provide very light efforts to kick off the whole process. So basically we need entity types. And the entity types come from the, the distance provision entity typing methods that we talk about, which just need to be provided with a knowledge basis. But we, there's lots of ways we can improve this whole pipeline. For example, how do you, how do you look at the results of the uh, meta pad um, and try to correct them um, in some sense? And you want to feed, look back and try to feedback these um, corrections to the beginning of the framework. So easily you can put human in the loop in different stages of this pipeline. And there will be a very interesting question like, how do you want to design this interface for human to put their feedback into, into this? And how do you write, a, how do you um, gonna ask the right questions to the human? And how do you sort of uh, partition your budget in asking human um, the questions? So there's lots of human in the loop problem um, within this context. And in terms of con constructing these hierarchical uh, faxic taxonomies, um, there's many more other things we can extend. For example, um, can we apply what we have already done, like a set expansion or phrase mining or meta pad to make this faxic taxonomy construction to be more powerful and uh, to cover more comprehensive domains? And this, lastly, we talk about this LiveNet project, which showcased that by extracting different kinds of structures and bring them together, we can navigate the knowledge within one domain, um, like analyzing the literature of that, uh, of a particular um, science domain. And this can be easily done um, by extending to other science domain, like mechanical engineering, physics, chemi chemistry, but that's one thing. Another very common topic is how do you gonna design the right data analytics tasks on top of the knowledge structure that you extracted from the text. So we talk about there will be different user interface that facilitate you navigating this knowledge. But then do you want to also predict some missing knowledge in the graph that you extracted from text and use those predicting knowledge to sort of uh, narrow down experts search space when they're solving the task. For example, when they're finding the treatment uh, for a particular disease, 
whether you can just pr pr provide them some new prediction, some competent predictions just based on the knowledge graph you, you extracted from the tax corpus. So there's lots of data analytic problems on top of the knowledge network that we can talk about here. Um, so at the end, we have different um, summarized work um, that talk about different stage of this uh, whole pipeline. So starting from, we have this um, frequent pattern mining in the data mining textbook. And then we have this information network analysis that talk about how we take a structured network to discover different kinds of interesting knowledge and build a downstream application to later we can find out entity structures. And now this tutorial is covering about how we find out a more a, a broader spectrum of different structures from text, including not only just entity, but relation attributes and so on. And we like to thank our funding sources, including our research lab, um, NIH, NSF, and so on. And this will be the end of the tutorial. And thank you so much for spending the time with us. And we'd like to take some questions. I think we still have a couple minutes left.